When I went to sleep last night, I thought we were going to do Leviticus chapter 3 and talk about the burnt offering and the sin offering and the guilt offering. But when I woke up this morning, I couldn't do that. It's Christmas Eve. And so we're going to talk about a Levitical Christmas. Now, we're going to, end, we're going to be in Leviticus, but if the clock behaves itself, and I've already put the clock under pressure... We're going to be everywhere from Genesis to Revelation. So just bear with me. This is the result of waking up this morning and saying Leviticus sacrifices is not for today. So we talked about watching for Christ in Christmas. Now we're going to watch for Christmas in Leviticus. Christmas by Luke and Matthew. Luke says, and this is King James, because for most of us in this room, you've probably read these verses this way more than any other translation. You'll see King James, you'll see New King James, you'll see ESV this morning. Just bear with me. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And we read in Galatians but when the fullness of time had come, exactly at that moment, and it wasn't just, okay, Mary and Joseph come to Bethlehem. It was the messenger from Rome. It was the Caesar. It was the Caesars before him. The fullness of time. We read in Leviticus, the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar, and they lay the wood in order on the fire. We're going to read next week in Leviticus about two of uh, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abinadab, and they offered unauthorized fire, and God killed them for it. Everything was done, we read in the, in the epistle to the Corinthians, in decency and in order. And so the fullness of time came, just like everything from the beginning of eternity, and we're going to talk about Christmas by the Gospel of John shortly. Everything was done in order, in the fullness of time. Matthew's Gospel goes like this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him book of numbers we read i see him this is moses speaking speaking i see him but not now he was in the desert but not near not at the time moses was alive yet i see him a star shall come out of jacob christmas according to the gospel of john you say well i don't remember reading about christmas according to the gospel of john well here it is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Well, that doesn't sound like Christmas. Well, verse 14 is Christmas. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The law was given by Moses, Leviticus, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We read in Exodus, For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. There was this cloud. And God spoke to the people from Sinai in a big booming voice, such that they said, Oh, let Moses talk to us, because if you give us commandment number 11, we're all going to die. But Leviticus begins, and the Lord called upon Moses and spoke to him out of the tabernacle. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Christmas, according to the law and the prophets. We've seen this verse before, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So the prophets, Isaiah said this, Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Born of a woman. Well, yet, duh, the, the baby comes from the mother. It doesn't come from the stork. 
But Mary didn't have a man. Gabriel said that the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. Conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary is our creed. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name God with us. According to the law. If a man lies with a woman and Joseph didn't do that, the Bible said that he stayed away from her until after Jesus was born. If a man lies with a woman and has an emission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. This is, in fact, the immaculate conception. Not that Mary was without sin. Mary called on God in the Magnificat, God my Savior. To be saved, you have to see yourself as a sinner. But it was an immaculate conception in that there was no semen involved. There was no uncleanness involved. It was Christmas according to the law. Luke continues. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. I added of Nazareth. We're going to see that shortly. He was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, I am not sure when the genealogy was recorded in Jerusalem. The custom was either at circumcision or it was at purification. Seven, eight days in or 40 days in. But it wasn't until 70 AD when the temple was destroyed that the genealogies were destroyed with the temple. But when Jesus was before the high priest and when Jesus was before Pilate, the genealogies were there. And so his name was Jesus of Nazareth. That's how it was recorded. And so when you see that sign, I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, that's where it comes from. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. He was. This is Christmas according to the law. Now, Paul was not the first to write about circumcision of the heart. I will tell you that circumcision has continued throughout the ages. For the Jewish people, it was a matter of observing the law. For Gentiles, it was considered a matter of cleanliness. But circumcision continued. Paul talked about circumcision, and he said, we're not talking about circumcision of the flesh we're talking about circumcision of the heart, cutting back my stubbornness, my stiff-necked people, and receiving the covenant of Jesus Christ. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, outwardly nor is sick circumcision outward and physical. This is revolutionary when he wrote this thing. Maybe. But a Jew is one inwardly. A circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. But I said, Paul wasn't the first one to bring about this revolutionary idea. In Deuteronomy, we read, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, so that you may live, circumcision of the heart. Jesus was half Jewish. The other half was divine. So even though he was God in the flesh, he was not above the law. And when the time came for their purification, 40 days in, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. We're going to see that not only Jesus tried his, well, Jesus succeeded. Jesus succeeded in fulfilling the law, but his family, Mary, Joseph, his siblings, they tried 
to observe the law. And we're going to see that. Leviticus 12. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she, she shall be unclean for seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying, and she shall not touch anything holy nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. So there we have the 40 days. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. At this time, it was the temple. When this was written, it was the tabernacle. She shall bring at the entrance of the tent of the meeting a lamb a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Now, we've talked about the burnt offering already. It was a free will offering, and the free will offering was to glorify God, to consecrate yourself, to realize Jesus is my all. We haven't talked about the sin offering yet, but these two offerings were brought as a matter of the purification 40 days later, but they brought two turtle doves. If he's not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord for his trespass, for his sin which he has committed, the uncleanness, two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. The sin offering came first to deal with the uncleanness and then came the burnt offering. And the Bible tells us if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Where? The Magi, they went to Herod, and he said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For he have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So Herod goes to the scribes and the Pharisees, and they said, oh, we got to help these guys. Where is this king of the Jews? Of course, Herod had his own motivation. He said, well, why don't you come back and tell me so I can worship him too? That wasn't quite his idea whatsoever. But the scribes, they go to Micah and they say, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me the one who is to be ruler in Israel, Jesus, King of the Jews. And we're going to see that because they had to go to Egypt and back, he wasn't Jesus of Bethlehem. He was Jesus of Nazareth. And Micah continues, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, where did these magi come from? The Bible doesn't say. How did they know about this brand new star that's moving across the sky? We say, I don't know of any stars that move across the sky. There are the constellations and you see them and they don't do anything. And there's the North Star. And it's been a great aid for navigation since the beginning of time. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I believe in a young earth creation. God didn't create this embryo that grew up to be Adam. He created Adam. And when God created the stars, he created the stars with the light beams already en route. So when somebody says it's so many billions of light years away and that becomes an old earth creation idea, with God, all things are possible. He put that star out there and he put the light in there. And you say, well, everybody can see that North Star. Everybody can see the Big Dipper. What about this star and how can its light be shining in just one spot. Well, if man can create the laser, God can create a sun with focus or a, a star with focus. And when that star came, 
just like the stars of a young earth creation, that star was put there in the fullness of time with a laser that led those people. Say, well, that wasn't a star, it was an asteroid. With God, all things are possible. But my contention is this, this. The Magi came from Babylon. And they traveled west. They followed the star. They saw the star from the east. They saw it. they were in the east when they saw it, and they followed the star. And this is Belshazzar's mother on the day of the writing on the wall. In the days of your father, Nebuchadnezzar, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in Daniel. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. We'll come back to that. An all-expense-paid trip to Egypt. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Notice when they came into the house. The Bible doesn't say how long Mary and Joseph were hanging out at the stable. The Bible doesn't say how he paid his rent. I'm going to guess that since he was a carpenter, he did some jobs for people and he managed to pay his rent. And over time, he got a place, not an inn, but in a house. Maybe he shared a house with somebody. We don't know. But we do know that the Magi came after the purification, after the 40 days, because I mentioned to you that Jesus' family wanted to observe the law. If they were just given some gold bullion, there's no way they're showing up at the temple with two turtle doves. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold for the king, frankincense for God, and myrrh for the embalming. We read about the grain offering, where the grain offering was grain and oil and frankincense. And the, high, the priest would take a handful of the grain and mix it with the oil, and that handful and that oil and all the frankincense were burned as a prayer, as worship to God. The rest of the grain and the oil were for the priest's consumption. Now, we're going to learn that the priests were fed with some of that grain, some of that oil. They were given the breast of the, of the uh, peace offering, and they were given the thigh of the priest offering. The reason they were given those things was this. The Levites had no real estate inheritance in Israel. They were given portions in the city, and they were living off the tithes of the people. Now, we're going to get to Jesus as the priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, and we're going to get to us being priests and kings. So as a Levite, as a, as a priest, my inheritance is not a piece of real estate. The real estate goes to the Jews. When Israel would, was kicked out of Israel back in the Roman time and it became Palestine, all of a sudden the church decided to substitute church for Israel. Well, that's not the case. We're priests and we'll rule and reign with God, but that real estate belongs to the Jews. From the Nile to the Euphrates, they can fight over Gaza all they want. When Jesus comes back, Israel is going to be the Nile to the Euphrates. So they were given gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And here's another interesting question for you. Who appeared to Zechariah? Gabriel. 
Who appeared to Mary? Gabriel. Who appeared to Daniel? Gabriel. And there were certain things that Daniel was told that he just needed to shut up. The clothes, not, well, both. He wasn't allowed to talk about it. But what did he get to talk about that he didn't write down? Keep in mind, if those magi came from Babylon, they had that book. But they also had Daniel. My position is, this is my story and I'm sticking to it. Gabriel gave to Daniel a gospel message, the death and the burial and the resurrection. And Daniel gave to the Magi, as the chief of the astrologers, the gospel of the death and the burial and the resurrection. And those astrologers passed down generation by generation for 500 years until these Magi, with all of the book learning that Daniel had given them, with the gospel that Daniel had given them, they came to worship the king. So back to the all-expense-paid trip to Egypt. The Bible doesn't say how long they stayed. The Bible doesn't say how they supported themselves. Joseph was a carpenter. He didn't have any battery-powered tools, so I guess he had to come up with some tools if, she, if he was, in fact, a carpenter. We don't know what happened to the gold and the frankincense in the myrrh. So it's really tongue-in-cheek that I say an all-expense-paid trip. The Bible doesn't say when Jesus' siblings were born. Jesus went as an only child down to Egypt. Did he come back as an only child? I'm going to fast forward and then come back again. Matthew 13, and when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his hometown, coming to Nazareth, he taught them in their synagogues so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? There are five, and Jesus, there are five boys in the family. And notice, and are not, they didn't use the word both. Are not all his sisters with us? So sisters is plural. He had at least two sisters. And in my opinion, as long as it's all and not both, he had at least three sisters. It was a huge family. How many of them were born in Egypt? We don't know. How many of them were born in Nazareth? We don't know. How many of them came to Jerusalem when Jesus was 12? We don't know if Mary and Joseph got a babysitter for them. Jesus was 12, so necessarily all these were 11 and younger. Did they come along with? Did Mary and Joseph, with all these kids, miss Jesus who was left in Jerusalem? We don't know. I can't wait to get to heaven to figure these things out. But when the Magi had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. Well, that comes from Hosea. Hosea said this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. When Israel was a child, well, 70 people went down at the time of Joseph. Two million came out at the time of Moses. But millions and millions have been born since then of the Jewish faith of the Jewish ancestry. And so, relatively, when Judaism was a child, God loved him and invited him, took him out of Egypt. But I want you to also notice the name Israel means who prevails with God. 
Now that name first appeared when Jacob was wrestling with God. And when they were done, God touched his hip and he couldn't walk straight anymore. And he changed his name from Jacob to Israel, who prevails with God. I can remember Jacob, he's eight years old now, and he started wrestling when he was three. And uh, at one point he was wrestling with his coach, sparring and whatnot. And when he was done, he came to me and he said, Papa, I don't think he was trying his best. <laughs> Well, God obviously wasn't trying his best because he could have turned Jacob into a puddle. But he was given the name Israel, who prevails with God. But now we're going to put a twist to that and say, who prevails along with God? Jacob against God, he wrestled with him. But now Jesus prevailed along with God. Well, he was God. I loved him, and I called him out of it, out of Egypt. So they returned to Nazareth. But when Herod died, died, and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and to Joseph in a dream, saying, "Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead." And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Now, for those that maybe get confused with the Herod, there were a whole bunch of Herods. Herod the Great was the one who built the temple and the one who was alive at the birth of Jesus and the one who killed all those babies. It was his son that reigned when Jesus was 33 years old, who killed John the Baptist, and Jesus appeared before Herod, and Herod and Pontius Pilate became friends. It was not the same guy. But they were afraid of that family, considering what the father had done. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and he lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he'd be called a Nazarene. So now we're going to fast forward to 12, age 12. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about Jesus' early days. Luke got his information through interview, coupled with divine inspiration. I can't wait till I get to meet with Mary. I can't wait to meet with his brothers. I can't wait to ask James, were you tired of hearing, why can't you be like your big brother? But at age 12, we see in Leviticus, this is a Levitical Christmas. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of the unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, a coming together. And this is where the Jewish people came up with the, the, the custom that the Jewish people go to Jerusalem on certain feasts. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. And on the seventh day as a holy convocation, you shall do no ordinary work. And we read this in Luke's gospel at age 12. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. It is mute whether he, they went to Jerusalem on those other feasts. We'll find out one day. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents did not know it. Now, Jesus never got into any trouble. Jesus, at 12 years old, was responsible. He could have been with the cousins. He could have been with his siblings. He could have been talking with the older people. G Joseph and Mary weren't worried about him. Keep in mind, they have all those other siblings going on. The phrase bar mitzvah means son of the commandments. And Jesus, in fulfilling the law, was not just the 
author of the commandments wasn't just the commandments in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He wasn't just the fulfiller of the commands, but the bar mitzvah. The phrase is not in the Bible. It's a religious ceremony when a boy is regarded as ready to observe religious precepts and is eligible to take part in public worship. And in the USA, the boy has to be able to read Hebrew and he's asked certain questions about the Torah, about the Pentateuch from the rabbi. Well, they just didn't come up with this custom. Where does it come from? After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Now, I don't know. I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have sat around and had Bible conversations. Somebody asks a question. There's an answer. There's a discussion. Somebody asks the question going back. And I can see this thing. And Jesus did it as an adult. They would ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus did this. They asked him if, if, uh, if, if the, the power was coming from God. And, and Jesus responded with a different ask, question. He said, you tell me. Was John the Baptist, was he, was he valid? Back and forth. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now we're going to fast forward to age 33. Leviticus. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, and he shall offer it of his own free will. Well, Jesus said in the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but your will be done. So did Jesus go to the cross under duress? The dad said, you have to do it. No. Hebrews tells us this, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Nehemiah said this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Jesus got his strength because of that joy that was set before him. And we sing joy to the world. Now, from the father's perspective, we read from Isaiah. Yet it was the will of the Lord, the father, to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. The sin offering and the trespass offering, Leviticus chapters 4 and 5. Jesus is the better sacrifice because his sacrifice wasn't daily. We read that when Solomon offered sacrifices at the dedication of the temple, there were 120,000 sheep. Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. This is all from Hebrews. He provided something better for us. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things, all the things we study in Leviticus, and next week we're going to go to the tabernacle and the diagram. All those things were blueprints or examples or copies of heavenly things because Jesus was the better sacrifice. He's going to bring about better things, things that belong to salvation, a better covenant, a blood covenant. The blood covenant started with the Adam covenant, where he covered Adam and Eve with skins. It continued with the Abraham covenant, where he divided the animals and the lamp walked in between. He talked of the covenant of the Mosaic covenant, but ultimately Jesus is going to provide the new covenant. He said, take this cup, which is my blood, a new covenant for you. Because we're going to have a better possession, better promises, better hope. The Bible talks about the living or the lively hope, the blessed hope. And we get, because of that sacrifice, a better life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Well, How is all that going to happen? And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah. Tell us if you are the son of God. 
again from Leviticus, if anyone sins in that he hears a public adjuration, I adjure you by the living God. This is what Leviticus is saying. If you're adjured to say something, you are under the law to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you don't, you've sinned. So we'll read Leviticus. If anyone sins in that he hears a public adoration to testify, and though he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter, yet he does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. But Jesus did speak. What did he have to say? He said, let me put it to you this way. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And that should have triggered in the high priest's mind these verses from Daniel. Behold, the clouds of heaven, there will come like one, a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and he presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Back to Matthew again. Then the high priest tore his clothes. We read from Exodus. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. This is talk about the high priest garment. It shall be a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. We read in John's gospel, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also the tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to him, let us not tear it. When that high priest tore his garment, that was the end of the Levitical priesthood. And the beginning of the order of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, king and priest, we're out of time, but I'm going to finish this up. Any day now. He gave me a booklet with that title. Any day now, plus seven years, I saw the heavens open and behold a white horse. And of his robe was written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And blessed is the one who shares in the first resurrection. That's yours truly and you too if you've received Jesus Christ. And only then will the angel's prophecy be fulfilled. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men.